so this is all math and a little less uh, strange, maybe. But it's strange enough. Um, so I'm starting here with Hamilton's quaternions. And I'll get to the octo oh, sorry. Otherwise I'll <coughs> shoot myself. Um, and I'll get to the octonian shortly, but um, um, this is a little piece of a natural drawing that I like. Um, and um, there's the rules for the quaternions in the usual form that everybody likes. And, and it is the form in which uh, Hamilton uh, expressed them when he wrote uh, the formula for the quaternions on the Rome Bridge in Dublin. After he had discovered it. Um, and this is the way it appeared on the bridge and is copied into a stamp. And, and as you see, they were discovered in 1843 by Hamilton. And, um, and the story is that he, he worked on this problem of finding a way to multiply in three space for many years and then finally realized he needed a fourth dimension to make the problem fit. And, um, and he was walking, uh, and, and then he said, I then and there felt the galvanic circuit of thought close, and the sparks which fell from it were the fundamental equations between I, J, and K, exactly such as I have used them ever since, and he carved the equations onto the bridge. I've never been in Dublin. But I'm told that, uh, that every year they have a walk from the Institute to the bridge and back uh, celebrating this. And you can find a plaque on the bridge that uh, probably reproduces part of what he did. So that's pretty uh, amazing. That was the first, um, really the first um, appearance of a non commutative algebra. And, it was, and you have to appreciate that it was before matrix algebra. Matrix algebra wasn't invented until some years later. So it's a little like the development I was sketching for you, where I say, suppose we didn't know matrix algebra, but we did this with the recursion, and we end up finding an algebra um, that he didn't find it that way. But there was no matrix algebra. And here it is probably some years later, I think. And Cayley and Graves discovered the octonians, which are a generalization of the quaternions. Graves in 43, um, Hamilton communicated to Graves his discovery, and Graves immediately figured out how to double it, uh, double the anti, anti, use eight dimensions instead of four, write down an algebra that continues to work has inverses for every element of it. it's non-zero, um, but turns out to be non-associative. And I guess Cayley independently discovers it in a couple of years later. <coughs> and Cayley is one of the inventors of matrix algebra, but you know the Artonians don't represent directly as matrix algebra because they're not associative. So it's still, if you try to understand the Artonians directly, you're, you're, out of the, you're out of the box as far as matrix algebra is concerned. Um, so I wanted to remind you about a couple of things about quaternions that are very nice. Um, if you have a, a unit quaternion, um, um, which means a squared plus b squared plus c squared, um, oh, I forgot the concept. <coughs> no, that's an R3 pure quaternion, right? Um, I call it a pure quaternion if it's just i, j, and k. and doesn't have a constant term. Right? Uh, that's an element in three space, or I think of a frame in three space as i, j, and k. All right? and, um, and then, um, and then um, uh, a unit quaternion, by a unit quaternion I mean somebody of the form, and actually I have one here, somebody of the form, um, a cosine plus a sine times a unit pure quaternion. All right? So this, is, this, this concatenates all the i's and the j's and the k's into one expression. It's one of these. Um, and the sum of the squares of these is one, so, this, and so that if the sum of the squares of these is one, you have something of unit length. So you can think of this as a cosine plus i sine, because it is in fact the case, although I didn't prove it here, 
that the square of any unit length pure of quaternion is minus 1. Let's prove it. What's the square of z? Well, you need a squared, b squared, and c squared, but they'll all go minus because i squared, j squared, and k squared are minus 1. These all anti commute, so you would have a, b, i, j, but you'd also have b, a, j, i, and it cancels out. So there isn't anything else left except the squares of the coefficients times minus 1. So you have minus a squared, minus b squared, minus c squared is the square of z. And if it's a unit length, then it's minus 1. So, so you have the situation that any unit quaternion, uh, pure quaternion, sitting in 3 space, has square minus 1. Infinitely many square roots of minus 1. All the different directions in 3 space. And any, uh, any regular, any ordinary quaternion is of a form scalar plus some multiple of um, a square root of minus 1. So a quaternion like this, which is a general unit length quaternion, like this up here, is the, yeah. Um, yeah, that squares to minus 1, so this looks like a little complex number, except that it won't commute with some of its fellows. Um, and then you can make a mapping from 3 space back to 3 space by conjugating by g multiplied by z multiplied by g inverse, which means per minus something. That turns out to rotate three-dimensional space by the angle theta. There are two of them in there, and they end up combining together to make it a rotation by theta. So you rotate by angle theta, um, and the axis is u. If you put the u right there in the middle, you would find that you got the u back when you did this. Rotations are specified by angle and axis. And I adopt the right-hand rule to talk about sense of rotation around the axis. So let's do an example. Take a cube. Take a cube and rotate it by 90 degrees around the vertical axis. And then rotate it by 90 degrees around the diagonal axis. So you see, I've, I've illustrated it for us. A goes here, and A, B, C go in circles around, and H, D, C, G, they sort of cycle around. Now I'm rotating around this diagonal, diagonal axis through H and B. So B, um, whoops, I'm sorry, that's not what I was doing. I was rotating around the horizontal axis, I'm getting to the diagonal axis. I'm following on the side. Vertical rotation, then rotate around the horizontal. So A goes down, D goes over, C goes up, right, like that. So I did this combined rotation, rotate by 90 degrees, rotate by 90 degrees. And you can see that the result is the same as if I had rotated about the diagonal axis through H and B. H and B are left fixed, left alone. And the other guys rotate around, C comes up, and so on. So that's 120 degree rotation around the diagonal. It's the same as two 90 degree rotations perpendicular to one another. Just checked by direct geometry. Right? Now you can do it by quaternions. You can say, okay, one of them is rotating around the j-axis, the other is rotating around the k-axis, perpendicular axes, by 90 degrees, the angle is half, half angle, pi over 4. Um, e to the j theta means cosine and sine appropriately multiplied by j. That's the form of the quaternion. And here's the other quaternion. And then multiply the two quaternions together, collect your terms. I'm not going to you know, drag you through it, I'll just show you the thing. And, and collect the terms, and lo and behold, there's the new one, with this and this are the cosine and sine, and here's a unit length diagonal, i plus j plus k is diagonal. And if you check the angles, they're correct, 120 degrees. So the multiplying quaternion is actually where we completely solves the problem of how do you find the resultant rotation from two rotations one around one angle and one around the other. So Hamilton eventually understood it this simply, but probably not at the beginning, um, and that he had actually solved the original problem, how to multiply rotations in free space. So that, that's quaternions. Um, and they're also topological. 
um, in the sense that every direction in space has a topological square root of minus one, which is what Dino was talking about. If you the observer attached to a belt walks all the way around something and comes back, uh, then the belt is twisted. But if you walk twice around, then the belt becomes untwisted. And it's from the eye. But, um, but we want to get to a little more about this, and then we want to get to Artonians. So this is one full twist. And you can play with one full twist. You can relax it a little bit, it becomes a curl. You can push that curl down across the thing that's hanging off the bottom and pull it underneath and bring it back up. And it's still a full twist, but it's going in the opposite direction. That's the best you can do with the twist. You can turn it into the opposite twist, but you can't get rid of it. No way to get rid of it. Uh, but if you twist by 720 degrees, then you can get rid of it. Um, and I didn't illustrate that, but um, it's easy enough to illustrate with a belt. And we can think about it here. Maybe we should do it. I, I had some equipment other than my belt that I forgot to bring it with. Maybe we should do this. Um, so we can hold that. And here's the end of the belt. Now, I'm thinking that I'm, allow, I'm going to be allowing the belt to move around, melt, the, the, the belt to move around this ball. This ball is not um, attached to anything. Of course, it is attached to something, me. Um, so if I'm going to move it around and have it go through as though it weren't attached, I can exchange hands. And then it becomes twisted the opposite way. So you have to allow me that, uh, that uh, uh, exchange of hands. But then if we do one full twist and then Another full twist, it's got 720 degrees of twist, and I bring it all the way around and back, and it's gone. The 720 degrees twist goes to zero. So that's what I was saying. Thanks. So, um, so that, that's what happens, and you end up representing the quaternions. That means that a one quarter turn, a one quarter turn of the belt, on four times, is the same as one. So the one quarter turn, one, one little turn, half turn, is um, one half of a full turn, uh, has order four, and looks like a square root of minus one. So then you can do the quaternions. Um, you can think of I as being rotating around one axis, J is rotating around another axis, and when you combine them, you will get a K be the rotation around the remaining axis, and it all fits in the quaternions. And the easiest way to do this um, uh, without a belt so that you can, you can get the conventions is with your hand. You take your hand forward from your body, open to the sky, and let I be rotate by 180 degrees counterclockwise uh, around the outward axis. Let J be uh, rotate counterclockwise by 180 degrees around the axis perpendicular, parallel to your body, and perpendicular to the floor. And you see that the resultant is a 180 degree counterclockwise rotation around the axis horizontal to your body going to the left. So I times J is equal to K. And I times J times K, which would require one more K rotation, gives you a 360 degree twisted arm, which is what it should do because 360 degree twist on the belt is minus one. So um, you can do this with the belt, or you can do it with your arm. If you want to see it with the belt with the same conventions, then you can throw the belt over your shoulder, and then you see um, I do I, and uh, then I do J, and that's the same as K, and if I do K one more time, then I have the belt twisted by 360 degrees. And then I can do the other operations. It's just, if you want to practice this and get the uh, convention straight, it's good to use the hand and body convention and then do it with the belt uh, this way so that you use exactly the same convention. And then you see that you have the quaternions directly in terms of those rotational motions 
with respect to your body. So the question is whether one could do something similar for the Octonians. But what are the Octonians? We haven't gotten to them yet. This is another depiction of that quaternion demonstrator I just described to you. Now let's talk about Octonians. So, we're going to add another square root of minus one. We're going to call it L. And L squared will be equal to minus one. And now I'm going to tell you rules for the Octonians that you can remember. At least, I could remember them the last time I used them. It's getting late, I know. I asked you to learn something new. Uh, but anyway, look at these. Um, I'm going to have L squared is minus 1, and LA is minus AL, and LB is minus EL, the anti-commute. But the crux of the matter is, what am I going to do with L times A times L times B? And things like that. And here are the answers for this. This is the A solution that works. You reverse the order. LA times LB is BA. L times A times B is L times BA. Reverse the order. A times LB is L times BA. Reverse the order. So it's kind of like going through a mirror. And any other question you might have about multiplying things has the obvious answer. These are the only ones you need to worry about. Now, if you think about this a little bit, you'll see it's not associated. And if you try to think about what can happen, if you try to extend the quaternions by an extra square root of minus one, it's not hard to prove that it has to be non-associated. I'm not going to bother you with this now. Talk about. But these are the rules. So you now know how to multiply octonians. So we'll do a little practice on the next slide. There's a new element whose square is minus one. Its interrelationships with the other guys is anti-commutes. And, um, and if you have a multiple product, like LA times LB, then the L squared goes away, and you have BA. Never mind that it's squared to minus one. If you have LA times B, it's L times BA. If you have A times LB, it's L times BA, um, and so on. Um, and uh, already you've seen some of the non associativity if you try to work it out. Okay, so now one of the beautiful things about this multiplication is that it fits into the final projected plane. That is to say, here is on the right the final projected plane. That is, it's a planar geometry with seven points and um, and each circle is um, one of these triplets. So I draw them in straight lines sometimes, but they're really circles, right? These triplets. Um, and then um, we have, um, let's try something out uh, that I have on the slide and see if I got it right on the slide. Take J times LI, all right? Where's J, L, and I? Um, J times LI, okay. J times Li is L times Ij, reverse the order. Ij is K, it's this. So you see, J times Li is LK. Now you can try the others and they will all work. Now, it, that's the direction in which I want to go. Um, Li times LK is going to be J, and so on. I get a little copy of the quaternions for each circle in the final plane. I did some of it here. Li times Lk is, L is Ki, and Ki is J, no one. And Lk times J, Lk times J, is L times Jk, and Jk is I, and so I get Li. So there's a copy of the quaternions. And you can check that you get a copy of the quaternions for each triple, and um, that's a picture of the Octonians. And uh, you can further check that if you look at a quite an Octonian uh, in the old quaternion way, scalar plus the sum of imaginaries, uh, then as long as it's on zero, it has an inverse and all. So that's how the Octonians look. Um, and uh, my fantasy is 
that, uh, that this idea is what occurred to Graves and Paley. Um, but it isn't written that way usually if you look it up in a book. You know, you see that it's got conjugates in it and some other things, and, it, and it's a more general, and formula encompasses every possibility, whereas I told you that this is the core of it, and then any, uh, anybody else gets an easy answer. So I hope you find this of some use if you wanted to fiddle with the Octonians for yourself, because otherwise you're always looking at the formula, trying to understand how they multiply. Now, um, I want to make a belt demonstrator for the Octonians. And the idea that Jonathan Hackett and I had, which is written up in an awkward way in the archive paper, and we sooner or later will write a better paper, uh, maybe along the lines of these slides, is that L, but the idea is that L takes on the role of a context switch or mirror that moves among a multitude of quaternion possibilities. So um, here is the idea. I have, uh, oops, I have a belt and a ball hanging from the belt. And, if I, and I have a dot here on the left, and this is a little sphere that's going around this. And if I'm just doing quaternions, then I define i, j, and k in the usual way, which I'm doing, which, which involves some choice. So, I is this one, J is that one, and K is this one for these pictures. And that means that if you do I, you rotate the ball, leaving the shell alone, the shell is the context. You rotate the ball by 180 degrees. And then if you do J, you rotate by 180 degrees this way. And that will turn into K, this way. And you can check that that works. That's quaternions. And all this is fine. So, but I have a dot. And what am I going to do with this dot? Um, I haven't told you anything beyond the dot yet. I'm just checking quaternions, but I want to do this quickly and give you an idea and stop because it's a long road. So, as I said, L is the context switch. And L turns the outer sphere around without doing anything and puts a dot on the other side. It changes the viewpoint, turns the outer sphere around. Um, but it will hold fixed the inner sphere along the belt when you use it as an operator. So L itself doesn't do anything. It just changes context. That's what its operation is. But when you do LI, LI is one entity and that one entity twists the outer sphere around this, holding the inner end of the belt fixed and turning the sphere itself. So, so that's, the, that's the difference between these operators. The quaternion operators, the basic quaternion operators, turn the base of the belt. The other ones turn the sphere that's holding the belt, and you hold the end of the belt fixed. So, Here's Li, you see? What happened with Li is that I held, held this fixed and turned the sphere. And I got a twist in the belt. And Lj it got a similar twist. And it's too late in the day to go through all the details of this. But the fact of the matter is that it works. And the reason that it works is because of that reverse of order. When you do the L, you actually are causing a reverse of order when you do it from the outside rather than the inside. And that those reverse of order rules are all that's needed in order to make this outer shell turn rather than inner ball turn work well in relation to one another. And you get a belt representation of the octonians. Could that be like the orientation or handedness? It is. Yeah. And so the portrait is like the rotation space, whereas that other context switch would be like an orientation operator that changes. So it's as though you have an object in space and you do something to it, or you have a frame in space in relation to the object and you change the frame in a certain way. Mm -hmm. 
And then these two kinds of operations fit together in the Octonians in this way. So this gives me hope that maybe the Octonians are actually useful in some basic way because they have to do with changing frames and changing rotations. And angular momentum, which we thought was interesting. Angular momentum has three aspects, one of which is handedness and another one of which is orientation. Mm -hmm. So you've got the orientation and you've got the handedness of it. They're separate, but they combine to create the angular momentum aspect. Does that have something to do with the fact, I was going to ask, um, the, the, the fact that the Octonians do not form a group because they bring associativity, is that, what are some of the implications of that? Is that, is this an, it could be a new way of classifying quantities like angular momentum like pseudo vectors, or does it have anything to do with well, He just put forth the idea of uh, angular relating of angular momentum. And you're immediately going to apply it, but I think we'd have to think about it. <laughs> but it's very interesting. And also, the octonians uh, are important in all the symmetries that they, they are uh, yeah. important fundamental physics, because they, they're all connected with the rotations and other things of octonians. The SU3, the SU2, the U1, and the um, e, E76, E8, all that kind of stuff. And the, the, the symplectic group. Yeah, and all, all those things are related to the symmetries of yeah. the octonian all, space. Somehow, they are all derived from these. So, so we haven't gotten up to the symmetries of the octonian space. We're just talking about the nuts and bolts of the octonian space itself. But, but uh, at least we got our hands on the, on the, on the, uh, uh, on the octonian space itself in this way, which will give us a chance to do more. So yeah, so this is in its infancy. And if you take those four parameters that I'm talking about, you've got eight units, and you can yeah. represent those as an octonian. And it's like if you have um, these breaking these algebraic rules, you each you're adding more and more degrees of freedom to what you can do. In my ontological phase of topological field theory, which I'll be doing instead of SETI, the octonians play an essential role in, in uh, Breaking the breaking the closure that I've been talking about for the last few years and reclosing it in the top all. Well, There's also another use for octonians. So sorry, uh, the, the 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 group that I have that prime four group. There's also a dual group. You put the two groups together, you can represent that with an octonian. So I don't know if it was probably a silly question, but uh, how do you? Uh, Generate the maybe strip with quaternions. How do I generate a Mobius strip? A Mobius strip with quaternions. Yes. Well, I'm kind of avoiding, avoiding Mobius strip. Said that there. That it has to do with the uh, twisting of the uh, so and if you twist and then you well yeah you so the Mobius so okay. um, I did say that the square of a minus one corresponded to a one half twist. Yes. But I'm not putting it back round and making a Mobius out of it. Um, I'm not against putting it back round and making a Mobius out of it. Uh, I'm not sure what happens there. No, but I, 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 my point was that can you represent it with the Well, that's what I just said. I don't, I don't know. I haven't been using a closed loop here, have I? I see. Um, because you need the rotation, well, not, not the rotation against the vertical axis, but also the yeah. rotation in the... Because if you join this, you, you rotate... The, the yeah, I mean, all these things depended on having uh, two ends to the string, if you like, right? Yeah. The, the, the contact stand and the, and the rotational end, right? And if I were to plug one into the other, then, uh, then I don't have any of that. I just have a nice circularity. Um, Mobius strips are very nice. Other things happen like that. You can do P's quaternion direct equation as a Klein bottle, which is a double Mobius strip. Yeah, that's in there. What was that again? You can do P's quaternion direct equation as a Klein bottle. Which is a oh. mirror symmetric Mobius strip, the dual left right yes, Mobius strip. So, you want to do the Dirac equation in 1 plus 1 on Klein bottom? Well, you can. I mean, it's. Yeah, it's you can do it. Well, 
form representation. Um, Why not? Yeah. I mean, you know, people feel. <laughs> This, this slide illustrates those things, but it's too late to do. I've tried both of these little calculations. I'm just telling you they work, and you can try them out, right? And that's probably enough for now, so we'll stop. Okay. Thank you, Lou. That was a marathon session for you. Um, we've got basically 15 minutes to break up time and I'm going to, as chairman, use chairman's prerogative and